How could a healthy, newly hired 23-year-old pilot, Jordi Adamez, lose control of a well-maintained twin-engine Cessna 310 just minutes after takeoff? You'd expect a mechanical failure, maybe an engine fire, something obvious. But no, the real killer here was invisible, carbon monoxide creeping into the cockpit and silently impairing Jordi's judgment. And today, I'm not just going to tell you what happened, I'll show you why it happened, and why this exact hidden danger has killed dozens of pilots before. So let's start with the flight itself. It was February 1st, 2022, in Danville, Virginia. Jordy was assigned an aerial survey mission. Nothing extraordinary, just a routine job. He did his pre-flight, started up, and then something important. He sat in place for about 8 to 10 minutes during taxi and run-up. That detail matters later. At 10.03 a.m., he took off. The climb looked normal at first. The Cessna gained altitude, climbing at over 1,000 feet per minute, but then suddenly, the performance dropped. The climb rate fell to about half, and acceleration basically stopped. A couple minutes later, the ADSB data shows something weird. Jordy put the airplane into a shallow left turn. Nothing radical, just 10 degrees of bank. But then, out of nowhere, the aircraft rolled right, hard, past 60 degrees, and plunged down into the woods. It was catastrophic, and there was no recovery. Now, the wreckage told investigators a strange story. The left fuel selector was in the off position. The left throttle was near idle. The left prop, control, was near feather. And oddly, the right fuel selector was set to the left main tank. That's a bizarre configuration. It paints the picture of a pilot who thought the left engine was failing and tried to shut it down. Well, it wasn't failing at all. So here's the question. Why would a competent, trained commercial pilot on his very first solo survey mission, partially secure a good engine. This is where the truly crazy part comes in. Toxicology showed Jordy's blood had 31% carboxyhemoglobin. That's the chemical marker for carbon monoxide poisoning. To put that into perspective, non-smokers usually have 1-3%. to Heavy smokers, maybe 10-15%. to 31% is a level where you're seriously impaired. Your brain is starved of oxygen. Reaction time slows. Vision blurs. Judgment falls apart. You feel foggy, confused, sometimes without even realizing it. So how did CO even get into the cockpit? Let's reconstruct the conditions. On that morning, the outside temperature was about 33 degrees Fahrenheit, so the cabin heater was almost certainly on. During taxi and run-up, Jordy had the airplane parked with a quartering tailwind, exhaust blowing forward along the fuselage. That heater fan? It likely pulled those exhaust gases straight into the cabin. It's subtle, it's invisible, and it's deadly. And here's the kicker. This airplane didn't have an electronic alarm. No beeps, no flashing lights, just a cheap spot detector sticker that changes color if CO is present. But it only works if you actually look at it. It's like having a smoke alarm that doesn't make a sound. Completely useless in real time. So Jordy probably never knew his body was being saturated with CO before he even took off. That's the real betrayal. Here. Now let's connect the dots. Even with CO poisoning, Jordy was still flying, but impaired. The aircraft started climbing sluggishly, and he may have misinterpreted that as an engine problem. Under normal conditions, he probably would have cross-checked instruments, analyzed carefully, and realized both engines were running. But CO doesn't let you think clearly. It messes with decision-making at the exact moment you need clarity. And this is where it gets extremely frustrating. Multi-engine training teaches a very simple rule. If one engine dies, you feather the prop, shut it down properly, and bank into the good engine to stay controllable. But Jordy, clouded by CO, did the opposite. He pulled back the left throttle, moved the left prop toward feather, set the fuel selector wrong, all signs he was treating the left engine as dead. Then, instead of banking into the good right engine, he banked left, toward the bad one. That is literally the worst possible thing you can do in a twin. But here's the nuance. Don't get me wrong, this wasn't just rookie error. Jordy was trained, rated, and had over 500 hours, with 85 in this exact airplane. The mistake wasn't purely an experience, 
The real culprit was physiological poisoning. A young pilot slowly incapacitated, tricked into thinking he had a left engine problem, when in reality, the real enemy was inside his bloodstream. Here's the part that's often misunderstood. People hear, he lost control and assume it was a stall, but that's not quite right. This was really about controllability, and it comes down to something called VMC, the minimum control speed. In twin engine airplanes, VMC is the lowest speed where you can still maintain directional control if one engine fails. It's not the same as stall speed. If you're above stall, but below VMC, the airplane still flies, but you can't keep it under control. The manufacturer publishes that number under very specific conditions. The dead engine, fully feathered, the pilot banking five degrees into the operating engine, and everything trimmed just right. For the Cessna 310, that magic number is about 80 knots. That's the textbook world. But Geordi wasn't in the textbook world. His left engine wasn't really shut down. The throttle was near idle. The prop was almost feathered. The fuel selector off, but not fully. So the left propeller was creating drag. The airplane was unbalanced. And then add the misset right fuel selector. That configuration completely changes the game. And here's the critical mistake. Instead of banking toward the good right engine, Geordi banked left toward the bad side. That one control input drove his real-world VMC way higher than the published 80 knots. How much higher? The NTSB's performance analysis suggested that even at 136 knots, which looks safe on paper, he was already below the actual controllable threshold. That's why the airplane suddenly rolled over into a steep right bank. It wasn't a slow decay. It was like crossing a line in the sand. One moment controllable, the next moment aerodynamically impossible to fight. And once you're in that situation, asymmetric thrust, draggy engine, wrong bank, no amount of control input can bring you back. It's not a stall you can recover from. It's an aerodynamic corner you simply can't fly out of. And that, more than anything, is why this became unrecoverable so fast. Now let's zoom out, because the invisible killer in this story, carbon monoxide, has been haunting aviation for decades, and the numbers are brutal. Between 1982 and 2020, the NTSB found 31 accidents directly tied to CO poisoning. 23 of those were fatal. 42 lives lost, four more seriously injured, and in almost every one of those cases, the pilots had no idea they were being poisoned until it was too late. What's really frustrating is the regulatory response. Back in 2004, the NTSB told the FAA point blank, require carbon monoxide detectors in all general aviation aircraft, and not the little disposable spot stickers, real detectors with audible and visual alarms, something that screams at you before your judgment collapses. The FAA's answer, we'll recommend it, but we won't mandate it. That recommendation only stance has stayed in place ever since. Think about how crazy that is. We're talking about technology that costs maybe $200 to $300. Pilots spend more than that on a single headset accessory. And yet, because it's not mandatory, thousands of airplanes are still flying with nothing more than a sticker that silently changes color. No sound, no light, no second chance, and the proof that it matters is right here in this case. After Geordi's crash, the operator, Sewell Ariel Surveys, immediately retrofitted their fleet with electronic detectors. Why? Because they realized this was not a freak one-off accident. This was predictable and preventable. If Geordi had had an alarm in his cockpit that morning, there's a very real chance he would have recognized the CO buildup, opened a vent, shut off the heater, and lived to fly another day. That's the part that stings the most. So, where does this leave us? The easy narrative would be, young pilot, bad decision, tragic result. But that's not the real story. Jordi Adamez wasn't reckless. He was 23, commercial rated, instrument rated, experienced in the type, and proud to start his first solo survey job. What doomed him wasn't lack of training. It was a perfect storm of a silent toxin and flawed cockpit cues. The lessons are bigger than one accident. First, carbon monoxide is subtle, and it doesn't wait until you're airborne. It can get you during taxi, during run-up, 
when the heater is on and the exhaust is blowing forward, pilots need to respect that danger even before rolling down the runway. Second, spot detectors are not enough. If you're a pilot watching this, do yourself a favor. Invest in an electronic CO detector with an audible alarm. It's the cheapest insurance you can buy, and it's the one thing that might save your life when everything feels normal, but actually isn't. Third, training has to evolve. Multi-engine syllabi often assume clean failures. An engine dies, you feather it, you bank into the good one. But the real world isn't clean. Sometimes an engine is only partially secured. Sometimes a pilot is impaired by factors like fatigue, stress, or yes, carbon monoxide poisoning. Training needs to simulate those messy, confusing situations where judgment is clouded because that's where the real danger lives. And finally, let's not forget the human side. Jordy was young, motivated, and doing what he loved. His name deserves to be remembered, not just as a victim, but as a reminder. His story can push awareness, encourage other pilots to take CO seriously, and pressure regulators to finally close this safety gap. If his death convinces even a handful of pilots to install a proper detector, or instructors to emphasize partial engine scenarios, then maybe, just maybe, something good comes from this horrible loss. That's all for our today's video. If this story opened your eyes, drop a comment with your thoughts, hit subscribe for more crash deep dives, and share this video so others can learn these lessons too. Thank you for watching. See you in the next one.